Welcome everyone to MCC Macau Business Webinar, Macau Gaming at Cross Crossroad, the public tender and beyond. Before the panel discussion, let us welcome FMCC Chairman, Mr. Ruger Vashuran, for the welcome note. Bonjour, good afternoon, members and friends of FMCC, the France Macau Chamber of Commerce and followers of Macau Business. As Chairman of the French Chamber, it is a great pleasure to welcome you at our webinar. Macau Gaming at Crossroads, the public tender and beyond. As Macau reaches three years of crisis and mostly having relied on gaming to drive any business, making Macau a true world center of tourism and leisure seems out of reach, at least for today, maybe not for tomorrow. While we are waiting for a powerful comeback and recovery after COVID, we are somehow coincidentally in the middle of a tender for the new casino concessions. Everyone is very anxious to know what the future could and will bring us locally and internationally. So a new era is surely around the corner. The French Chamber is glad to join hands with Macau Business Agency to organize this webinar with three well-known industry expert panelists, whom I thank for their participation. I thank you all for joining and I wish you an interesting and fruitful webinar ahead. And here we hand the microphone to Jose Carlos Matias, Director of Macau Business, to introduce our panelists. Thank you very much and enjoy the show. Thank you very much, uh, Rutger. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, my great pleasure to host this uh, very important and I believe exciting webinar and for this cooperation between Macau Business and uh, France Macau Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we're so blessed for having this panel um, and for holding this at uh, such a, a critical and critical juncture. So I'd like to welcome uh, you all. Uh, first of all, uh, the guest speakers and also all those who are joining us uh, via Zoom. Um, it's uh, it's really, really meaningful. And uh, without further delay, I mean, I think we all know the context. We all know uh, where we are. We're just not quite sure as for where we're heading to. You know, so that's also a bigger question looming larger in our in our talk. Uh, I'd like to introduce our our speakers. Uh, we have uh, George Costa Oliveira, founder and CEO of uh, JC Consultancy, uh, Vitaly Omansky, Managing Director and Senior Analyst at Bernstein, and uh, Alida Tash, Managing Director at 2NT8. They are all, well, well seasoned, they're all experienced, uh, very highly knowledgeable uh, people and experts when it comes to Macau's uh, casino and gaming industry, uh, and they have uh, uh, a lot to share with us. And I would start uh, with Jorge Costa Oliveira. Good morning, Jorge, You're joining us from, from, from Portugal. Um, and well, uh, it's widely known you, among many roles that you played here in, in Macau and in the Macau SAR, you were actually a member of the uh, commission uh, for the first public tender to grant casino concessions uh, some 20 years ago. And here we are, uh, two decades on, uh, at a very different uh, juncture, different time, different era. Uh, how do you look at this from your uh, vantage point, I shall say? Yeah, good morning, Zé Carlos, and all the participants. Oh, good afternoon there. Um, well, 20 years have passed, and uh, obviously today we tend to focus on the difficulties that are visible to everybody. Um, slowdown of China, and especially the dynamic zero COVID policy. But at the end of the day, um, if you look back, you, you, you can see that uh, in structural terms until 2019, prior to the pandemics, um, the Macau operation of casino gaming did not change that much. It was still pretty much reliant on VIP gaming, which should be called credit gaming. It is still pretty much, it lies pretty much on uh, partnerships with uh, uh, new investors um, as, as, time, as time went by and as the because in operators, the concession has wanted to have less and less exposure. Uh, the regulatory environment was not improved. I mean, we did some things. We did the, the law in 2001. We did done some pieces of legislation, but there was no political will to uh, willingness to to go further. You know, for instance, Macau still doesn't have among its several codes mm -hmm. on tax code doesn't have a, 
a code or a piece of legislation regarding the special gaming tax, which is unbelievable. But um, uh, and we still continue to have uh, a very very poor degree of uh, monitoring and inspection of gaming activities. Um, the big change, in my opinion, is not that much in the legislation. Everybody's putting their eyes there. There were some amendments. That's it. And some of the things are obvious. So there's a lot of continuity, and there's, uh, which is normal. I mean, Macau government used to be, like in Hong Kong, a coalition between strong uh, businessmen and higher ranking civil servants. The strong businessman disappeared. The one that today leads the government actually is, is a seasoned politician. Uh, I don't think he manages or has managed any relevant company of his family group. So we have we have a posture of people that are very very scared with the uncertainty of all this. Uh, beats the hell out of me why they decided so much to go ahead with the with the tender. But the main difference, in my opinion, lies in. Uh, the circumstances surrounding the tender. And the circumstances surrounding the tender are very, very different. Uh, first of all, there's a huge uncertainty in terms of the economic scenario around. Um, and I, I think that all the, all, all the tenders must have hired people with crystal balls because I really don't see how they can foresee what is going to happen in the coming two or three years, let alone beyond that. And um, it all depends on visitation from China up to now and how, how, how are the borders going to continue, if, if the borders are continuing to be closed and all depends on the zero COVID policy. There's an expectation that after the party Congress in October, uh, that will be uh, gradually and if possible, swiftly uh, changed. But there's really no, no willingness and the, the political speech is actually encroaching on how good it is the, the the zero COVID policy, which everybody else in the world must be stupid because nobody adopts it. But um, at the end of the day, this is a, a huge condition for Macau. And this, it is very, very difficult. This is a great difference with before, the uncertainty that lies, that, that arises from there. On the positive side, there is a clear willingness on wishing that casino operators target gamblers from other jurisdictions. And uh, when, when, when I have a role in that area, I pushed strongly in this direction, but nobody cared because the, the Chinese market or the, the market of urban China, to be more precise, mm -hmm. is so huge, was so untapped. It, there was so much potential for growth. And the, the entities that operated there, the gaming promoters were unwilling to go to new markets because they don't speak languages, they don't feel at ease. And the casino operators, you know, this has to be said in blunt terms, well, became fat, fat cats. They didn't do anything. They were not interested in doing anything. VIP gaming, they send it, they, they, they packaged it to, to, to the respective junkets, and that's it. Um, the bad thing on the in terms of overall environment of the tender is the return of the in-kind obligations. Yeah. Uh, especially in, 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 in the terms in which it was it was put in, in the law. Um, and this is, and this is something, George, sorry, sorry to jump in and very, very quickly before we move on. And this is something that actually uh, you have addressed previously, uh, your skepticism towards uh, uh, putting forth as a requirement in-kind uh, obligation, something that is more to do with the pre-liberalization era than with the post-2002 framework, right? No, there are two angles there. Yeah. Yes, you're right, Sir Carlos. The, one of the reasons why I don't like in-kind obligations is because the way they were set up with a monopolistic operator before, some of them, they were really, really not obligations. I mean, you are obliged to develop the low type area. This is a guarantee that you have a huge amount of land. Uh, it's a pre-bank, pre-land bank uh, guaranteed in the concession contract. So to call it an obligation is really you know, not, not, not the best way of viewing it. So in many other clauses in the contracts, they were ridiculous. Uh, why should the operators pay for legal translations and things of the kind? Um, and the, the second reason why I, I don't like any kind of obligations, it's because it does not make sense. I mean, casino operators have to operate casinos and integrated resorts with correlated activities, 
period. They pay a high amount of taxes. It's the Macau model, an oligopolistic uh, model with a high level of taxation. With that taxation, the government done thus, what, whatever it deems to be necessary for the progress and development of Macau. It is up to the government to set up the strategy and the policy and to open, either operate or open the tenders for hospitals, transportation networks, and whatever you, you may think in terms of infrastructure. Now, the government does not apparently, does not want to do that. And it, we are going to have Macau being developed in the coming years by proposals made by casino operators on areas that have nothing to do with gaming. I am sorry, I'd like to be nice, but this is utterly stupid. George, I will now bring uh, Vitaly to the conversation and uh, let's talk about uh, uh, hooking up with, with what uh, George was just saying. Let's talk about the non-gaming extensive requirements that we can see in the tender program. Uh, were you surprised when you came across the 10 plus one points? Um, hi, Jose. Um, oh, hi, welcome. And welcome and good afternoon to your face just next door, so to say, in Hong Kong. So, look, I think, you know, for the past 10 years, the, uh, the message from the Macau government has been about development of non-gaming. It was never really defined. Um, I think the operators did what they could in the context of developing integrated resorts. And what we saw over the last 12, 13 years in Macau um, and a little bit earlier for, for the likes of Sands was the development of large scale integrated resorts that have many non-gaming features and components. The reality is these are all commercial enterprises and they build things for the purposes of maximizing profits and the maximization of profits in a gaming monopoly, which is Macau relative to the greater China market, is to drive gaming customers into Macau. It's not to drive 80 year old group tours that spend no money in Macau. It's not to drive hordes of children to go to amusement parks. It's to drive high value customers who can spend money in Macau, both in gaming and non-gaming. And that's been what's happened in Macau for the past 20 years. The government's focus in the current concession process has been to expand the realm of non-gaming by giving kind of broad definitions, almost a hodgepodge of let's throw everything into the pot and see what actually comes out of it. I do not expect all of these potential tourist developments or attractions or however you want to characterize them coming to fruition. It's unrealistic. It's not going to happen. All six operators are not going to build all these things. And many of these things don't even make any sense. The model that Macau needs to be looking at is Las Vegas. And not just looking at the strip and saying, wow, there's so many non-gaming amenities. But how did those gaming and non-gaming amenities actually come about? And they came about through a partnership between the government and various developers who understood the changes that were taking place in the gaming space in the United States and decided to effectively, over time, build a not just a gaming destination, but an entertainment destination, a tourist destination, a convention destination, because that's what worked for Las Vegas. And that was done in conjunction with the government, who acted as a very good partner, um, and by the various developers and operators that, that built new properties in Las Vegas. And that took a very long time to do. Um, Macau has the opportunity and has had the opportunity to do something similar. But as, as, as George was referencing, the government seems to constantly just push everything onto the gaming operators who are often unequipped and unable to deal with things like the development of proper infrastructure, right? The build out of tens of thousands of new hotel rooms if there is limited space in Macau. All of these things matter in order to drive actual tourism. It's very easy to say we wanna have more non-gaming tourists. The question is how do you actually develop that? And that's not gonna be done in a vacuum by a single operator or all six operators. It's just not realistic. Interesting. Uh, Ali, that um, this, uh, well, still talking about this, uh, the, I think the question is how likely, and I think Vidali was uh, uh, somehow starting already to address this, uh, how likely are the operators uh, going to move the needle on, on, on gaming? And also, when it comes to all these requirements, I mean, we have seen over the years uh, the, op the gaming concessionaires, or at least uh, some of these concessionaires, delivering when it comes to infrastructure development development, and also, uh, of course, uh, by 
having the integrated resource model working uh, in full swing. Uh, how do you look at this uh, conversation on non-gaming and the way ahead? And welcome, you are joining us from the cap. Yes, thank you for talking to you. Um, yeah. Actually, I have a couple of very short comments to- Sure, to go ahead. That's what George said. Um, George had a seven, eight minute answer. I'll have a one minute answer to the difference between then and now, 20 years ago and now. 20 years ago, mainland China's government was neutral towards gaming. Now it is anti-gaming. We saw it through anti-corruption, what happened in 2013, 14, and it had major effects. It doesn't like gaming, it's holding its nose. The chief executive of Macau, the first chief executive of Macau was pro-gaming. The second chief executive was neutral when it came to gaming. The current chief executive is anti-gaming, which is why we're having, we're in the bind we're in right now. So that's the, that's the major difference between the three, which is why it is very difficult for the government. Now, let's be fair, mainland China, the mainland go government did ask China, Macau in 2013 and 14 to stop this ostentatiousness by saying, this is ridiculous, get rid of junkets. And it didn't, and it didn't, and it didn't until in 2021, last November, it said, you know what, we're doing it ourselves. And basically the head of the top two junkets went to the source. So it, Macau sat there, didn't do much, China cleaned it, cleaned it up for itself. As to non-gaming, I agree with Vitaly. I think this is a capitalist enterprise. This is a, this is a, these people have spent billions of dollars. I think last count something like 35 to $40 billion of capital expenditure has been spent on just building the, 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 the number of integrated resource we have in Macau. And the biggest challenge these operators have is it is difficult to get mice meetings, incentives, conventions, exhibitions into Macau when they don't control visas. The government needs to play ball. The, the, the government needs to partner up. Venetian has one of the largest mice facilities in the world. And yet, why would anybody from mainland China who can go to Guangzhou, who can go to multiple places within China, who can go to Hong Kong right next to the airport, have to go get a visa to come to Macau where the visas are not so, so easily granted? The government needs to also partner up with the, with the, uh, with the government, with the uh, casino operators and the integrated resort operators by opening up the blue cards, allowing people to come in. What we've seen over the last four or five years has been to basically kick out anybody who is out from outside, even though it takes five, 10, 15, 20 years for a new science, a new area to be shifted to the locals. And right now, if they want us to help out with mice and help out with museums and theaters, I doubt if they're going to allow the relevant expertise from the outside to come in. So I think those are two of the things the government must realize. If you want the, the, the IRs to proceed with all these non-gaming, these 11 non-gaming, which I agree with Vitaly, is ridiculously long list, in, you need to partner up and you need to give them the ingredients so that these integrated resort chefs can make you what you want to actually eat, in this case, non-gaming. Mm -hmm. Interesting, good point. So uh, when it comes to like, uh, this is a more political issue, so, uh, everything is politics, right? And these days are uh, highly politicized in many ways. Uh, I mean, the very own concept of a concession uh, and the difference between a concession and a license. I'm not going to into you know, legalities here, but I would like to bring this into um, a broader context. Uh, of this uh, so-called common prosperity agenda that it kind of trickles down from the North and actually has this idea of what is supposed to be the role of a, of a large scale private company and the private sector in the new era. So how do you see this? Adida, you wanna, you wanna join the conversation? I'm talking about the political uh, era and environment that comes from all the way from Beijing and somehow somehow of a knock-on effect on, on, on businesses uh, and the uh, model here in Macau. Well, as you know, Macau and Hong Kong are both SARs and yet they behave so differently. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong has had the freedom, has been punished for, and has sometimes been rewarded by being less reliant on mainland China for its economy. And as a result, it's adapted, it's, it's uh, come up with its own um, fight with COVID, which had, uh, for a couple of years was pretty terrible. And as a matter of fact, it can actually survive much better. Macau, unfortunately, is beholden to mainland China. 
So politically, it has no power. The chief executive of Macau cannot uh, adopt the Hong Kong's policy when it comes to um, going it alone, uh, deciding to open uh, something. So we are going to basically follow whatever the China, whatever China says, because most of the government revenues come from gaming, and seventy to eighty percent of gaming comes from mainland Chinese. So. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we whatever China decides to do, whatever the government of mainland China does, we have to basically follow, mm -hmm. um, which which would mean COVID zero is going to continue until Beijing says no. And in which case, we just have to follow. Uh, Vitaly, when you when you like, of course, I mean this is a we're talking about a private business, and uh, it has to have a business model that is uh, that adds up. But uh, with all these uh, social and political contacts that we've got nowadays. Uh, how do you expect uh, uh, gaming uh, concessioners to adjust to, to the to the new era? Well, look, I think at this stage it's 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 very unclear what direction Macau is going to be able to take, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen in China over the next twelve to eighteen months in terms of China's government's willingness to open the borders, to let people come to Macau. Obviously, we know where the junk gets stand, right? So we can wa wash that business out. That business is gone. But the opportunity for mass and premium mass remains very high, but it all boils down to whether the Chinese government will allow people to come. And it's not just visas. It's also the ability to come here unfettered with respect to moving some money over, um, frequency. You know, there's a whole host of issues beyond just issuing some visas, right? Or reducing quarantine requirements or, or, or something of that nature. Um, and I think at this stage, look, I'm optimistic that we will get back to a level of business and, and visitation volumes that we've had in the past at some point. I mean, it's not gonna happen next month, it's not gonna happen next quarter, but at some point it is likely in my view that China will reopen. They're not gonna keep isolationist, um, but it may take a while to get there. And then when we get to Macau, it really boils down to what is Macau gonna be able to do with respect to driving the gaming demand coming out of China, the notion that somehow Macau is gonna transform itself into an international destination for gaming is unrealistic in the short to medium term. It's probably unrealistic in the longer term as well, unless the Macau infrastructure and economy is completely transformed, which is not a two or three year process. Um, Human capital is probably the biggest constraint in Macau. The ability to hire people with expertise, as Ali Dad was talking about, in, in, in various areas um, is non-existent in Macau. The ability to hire low-level labor at a cost that makes sense from other jurisdictions is extraordinarily difficult in Macau. And in the end, you guys live in Macau. In the end, Macau is a very, very small place. Right, so it's 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 a combination of the government of Macau having to work with operators to create an environment that's conducive to expanding the economic footprint of Macau, and to not solely rely on gaming. The reality is, and everyone everyone can talk a big game. The reality is, Macau is completely dependent on the gaming industry. Right, it just is. And the gaming industry should actually be a driver of further diversification in Macau because it provides the government with an enormous revenue stream and the ability to actually encourage development, encourage business, encourage economic activity in other areas. But that's what the gaming industry should be used for. It should actually be used to grow and allow the government to further diversification. Don't go to the operators and expect them to develop a whole host of things that they have no expertise in because it's never gonna happen. So I think that's that's where the disconnect really lies. On the on the Chinese government front, there's really, you know, we can we can debate all day long about whether the border will reopen at some point and when it happens. Nobody knows. Nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody knows, unless you're sitting in in um, in Chairman Xi's head, you're you're not going to know when any of this is going to happen. So, uh, I mean, like it could be a fruitful discussion, but it doesn't lead to anything. <laughs> My assumption is at some point the borders reopen and things happen. Then there's a whole other discussion around what does the Chinese economy look like after all of this? Are people still willing to spend money? Is the is the class of customer that Macau attracts, which is not the 1.4 billion people that live in China, it's probably 
at most 60 million people of China, in China, and of which a very small fraction would come to Macau, that's the people that we're talking about, right? It's it's the upper it's the upper classes, it's the upper middle class and the upper class that can afford to come to Macau. That's your target audience. Yeah, and this is also obviously related to their disposable income and also the issue of capital mobility and, the, and all of that, right? Absolutely. Look, if somebody's making five thousand dollars US a year, they're not coming to Macau. Like that's not a Macau customer. So I think you need to be realistic about what the potential for for tourism is, because look, you can open the floodgates and let in tens of millions of working class, right, lower middle class Chinese from Guangdong who will come into Macau and not spend any money. They'll just congest the infrastructure and it's not going to be value added to anyone in Macau. So what's the point of doing that, right? The point is Macau is a very small place. It's a very limited space. There's only 38,000 hotel rooms in Macau. It'll grow a little bit. The 38,000 rooms in Macau that were running at 92% occupancy in, in 2019, that doesn't give you a whole lot of room to grow unless you get rid of the Macau gaming customer. And if you get rid of the Macau gaming customer, the Macau economy will collapse. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty straightforward. There is no diversification in Macau. Nothing in Macau exists that could replace the potential gaming economic impact on the city. I, I just want to second what the uh, Vitaly was saying about Macau appealing to people from outside other jurisdictions. Look, dealers are required by law to be from Macau. And dealers, because it's a good position and you don't have to do much, you sit there and it's a pretty good salary, um, they don't have to be educated. Therefore, they only have to speak Cantonese and perhaps Mandarin. That is not a welcoming, there's not many dealers who speak fluent enough English to be able to attract the Korean and Japanese a Singaporean and Filipino to come to Macau and gamble. So as long as Macau continues to have these areas, which require a warm culture, which are welcoming culture, Macau is going to be very cool. Whereas it's a typical Korean, Japanese, Southeast Asian is going to get much better service, customer service, as well as the ability to ask where things are uh, in any one but Macau. So Macau, uh, appealing to the foreigners is really, really a lot. Uh, it's a big ask. I, I also, I, I agree with you. It's, all, it's just not going to happen. I don't see it. Thank you. George, I mean, you, you remember quite well, I mean, from, uh, uh, let's say, 1980s, 1990s, how the market was in terms of the source uh, of uh, gamblers and uh, we used to have uh, an important portion of our of our gambler, gambling coming from, um, of course, obviously Hong Kong, a uh, key market, but also Japan and, and, other, and other places in, in, in Asia. Do you see us going back, of course, to some extent, to a bit of that structure somehow? Look, uh, at the time I didn't follow gambling. I was not a regulator. My knowledge is what public information, but as far as I could dig in when I when I had to handle the, the, the matters. Um, Macau was never a place for gamblers from other jurisdictions outside China, including Hong Kong. But there were some. Now, this said, and, and in certain cases, it lost even the VIP market for tax reasons. For instance, the gamblers that came and rich people that came, for instance, from Indonesia were lost in the 90s because the casinos in, in Australia could provide better deals for the junkets. So the junkets start to take those people there. So, the, but apart from that, where I don't agree necessarily what, what was said here in, as regards that, this, this part, mm -hmm. is that nobody can know about this because it was never tried. Okay? So I understand that it is not wise to create a model based on replacing the gamblers that come from mainland China uh, or the customers in general, not only for gambling, but for other for related activities in, in resorts from customers that come from other jurisdictions. But the reality is it was never tried. So this is a positive thing on this tender and something that I battled for a long time in the, in the Macau Gaming Commission to be done. But the weight of the Macau junkets is huge because they are perceived by the political, by the politicians in Macau as the local component of gaming. 
and although most of them actually are from Hong Kong, they really do not want to go, they don't see any rationale to go beyond uh, China because there was so much to grow in terms of business model. And, and also because many of them, they have the difficulties that Doria here referred about for, for dealers, for instance, Jenkins usually don't speak other languages apart from Chinese. So if you ask them to go to other places, they won't do it. But it is, in my opinion, if you put pressure enough on the concessionaires, they will find junkets within the same segments of, uh, of, of customers that uh, Vitaly refer in India, in Southeast Asia, in Japan, in many other places. It is a matter of putting pressure and conditioning. That has never been done in Macau. So in this respect, is there is it a, a positive move? Is there potential? I believe there is potential. Now, is it wise to create, to build your, your, for instance, your budget model in terms of the government or the overall level of revenue based on it? No, but there is potential. And I think that what is being tried is, is good. The big thing that I'd like here to, to, to refer is, I, I'd like to, to, to what was said before, I think there are two things that are important to, to mention. The first thing is the idea that Macau is very different from Hong Kong, doesn't have critical mass, it's far more dependent from China and the central government, this is all correct. Where's the big difference? The big difference is the idea that then people jump into saying, oh, and because of that, the policy in Macau is defined by Beijing. Now, guys, trust me, I, I handled this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. The fact that gaming is a social demon in China inhibits everyone at the political level in China to be interested in defining policy and putting their hands there, okay? For them, it's a toxic thing. So they want to control, they want to supervise, they have complaints here and there, they have to intervene. But usually what I found is they ask things. They ask, they want you to explain, they want, but it, is the, it has always been the prerogative of the government to be, if you're proactive, you can explain why you're doing this, why you're not doing that, why this sector is complaining, and you can move ahead with, with reforms. The main complaint I always found from the central government was about the un, incapacity or unwillingness to move towards the diversification of the economy. And it's difficult. Of course, Macau has a very low level of critical mass of talents, as the Chinese say. But um, again, was that ever tried? Not really. Even recently, even with the, the pressure, the possibilities that the, the financial, that are open in the financial sector by the uh, outline development plan of the Greater Bay Area, Macau government, the first opportunity that they were asked, they said, no, 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 better send it to Hong Kong. So it is these that put the guys in Beijing crazy and very rightly so. But now they have a problem because they decided to have loyal people, not very intelligent running Macau. And so the problem that we have today is that when it comes to define policy, it's easy to say, oh, it, it is defined by Beijing. No, in gaming, it is not defined by Beijing, okay? It is the Macau government that still has a lot of leeway to do and it's not doing a great job because they don't know, okay? Now, it was said that the first so Macau chief executive- How could you be optimistic? Sorry, how could you be optimistic? Here you are saying it's not Beijing, it is the Macau government and they don't know what they're doing. So, and you say you're- No, I, I say they're not knowledgeable on gaming and they don't want to diversify. Now, why am I optimistic? Because Macau has a monopoly of gaming inside China first. Now, I'm far more concerned to, to, to be very blunt, I mean, the biggest problem, for instance, on VIP gaming, and, and I'm going there in a minute, is not even anything related to Beijing. It's Thailand. It's between Bangkok and Pattaya. There are two or three resorts. And, 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 and even if they don't legalize credit for gaming, but in fact, it works, as it used to be the, the case of Macau before 2001, if this is done, Macau is, not, is going to see 50% of its revenue from, from, from 2019 to be wiped out and cannibalized by, 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 by Thailand. So this is not a joke. I mean, this is, this is what I'm worried about. Now, the VIP gaming used to account in, in 2019 was still responsible for 50%. Now, there's one thing here. Now, books will be, will be written about this, and I'm not really sure if anyone is completely right, but as I perceive it, Sun City and Takshun were not prosecuted because of what they did in Macau. They were prosecuted in Wangzhou and in other metropolitan areas of China because they were utterly stupid. 
of proof of, of targeting through online gaming, customers from the mainland, they were repeatedly, repeatedly warned. The Macau government was warned and decided to look to the floor. This is why the gaming inspection needs to be efficient, needs to be run by people of integrity, especially needs to have people that know how to reason and to understand that they're not in, in only living in that well, that things are interconnected. So, and because Alvin Chu, Alvin was not smart because they continue to target China, mainland Chinese uh, customers from the Philippines and from other places, they, and not everybody flows like Sianukville, and because huge amounts of, of, of betting were involved, the Chinese public prosecutor's office to, 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 to came at them. Now, as far as I know, from the accusation and the charges that were done, at least in one jail for Sun City and Alvin Chow, were not, did not mention Macau. The authorities in China have been very careful about not harming the VIP gaming, not saying that the activities that the junkets do in Macau that involve connections with the mainland are completely illegal. Now, we all know what the Chinese law, what the mainland China law says. So, but they have been careful, even under this leadership, which is very, I agree, it's more, it's, it's less neutral, let's put it like that. And it, 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 it fights all the, connect, all the entities that uh, one way or the other are connected in the mainland with Chinese, with, with, with the junkets of Macau. They have been careful. And this is the reason why you see that the Macau government did not change a lot the regulations on, on, on junkets. And they really don't know, like any of us, no one knows how this is going to evolve. Is there a guarantee that Jankets will not be able to, to, to operate, assuming that the borders will be open, say, in January? Nobody knows. I believe that that possibility is there, but it needs to be handled carefully, intelligently, and in a way that it does not provoke social harm and is not visible as it is to be. Now, the problem here is, the, the, the junket groups, they became so large in Macau that they started to have operations as concessionaires or licensees in nearby jurisdictions. And then, and this is almost inevitable, but Macau, the Macau government needs to think about the posture that it has towards them. And perhaps the price to pay is if you want to have it to be a junket in Macau and to operate inside mainland China, we don't want to take risks and you cannot operate in any other jurisdiction, period. Or something else, but it has to be thought about how to do it. What does not make sense is to not discuss this and pretend that 50% of the GGR, yeah, we'll see how it runs. How can anyone, a company or a government, make any business model or any planning based on this? So yes, there are lots of uncertainties. But Vitaly, this I don't agree with you. The VIP market is never going to disappear. Okay? Even when it was unlawful here and, and, and there were people in, in China fighting it, it did not disappear. The most that will happen is that it may go underground and that you will find mechanisms, which I mean, let's be blunt. If we're speaking as if in China, everything is abiding, is strictly legal. So look at, the, look at the, 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 shadow, the shadow banking. I mean, it would not, this would not be impossible to happen, but is it likely that, that it happens like that? No. The problem is today, there is greater scrutiny, there is greater visibility, or greater visibility, uh, all the junk, the junkets are all the same for all the groups. This this idea that there are good junkets, which are the ones that deal with you, and bad junkets, or the junkets that die in Singapore are good. They, they are not nothing to do with with the Macau junkets. When resorts try to create their own network of junkets, they realize Linda Shen, which is quite competent and comes from that sector, realized it was impossible to do it. So now there are no new wheels to invent here, as regards China. What needs to be considered is how. How, how gradually you allow this to this activity to go on in order to avoid having uh, a wipeout of a significant amount of revenue. And this is not only relevant for the groups, it's also relevant for the government. Sorry. Let me talk about, uh, thank, thank you, George, about revenue and that, what, you know, there's a, a lot of food for thought. You know, Vitaly, in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, no, I mean, I know these are not the best of times for the crystal ball business, but I think we can we can project something. Uh, you, 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 a few days ago, you were saying that the, the, the gaming industry of Macau won't, uh, likely won't see a full recovery until 2024. But what could be like sort of, um, I'd say, uh, 
uh, allow me to use the, the buzzword, no new normal of the gaming industry. If you look, let's say, for instance, of where we are now, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, so far, uh, uh, gaming revenue, gross gaming revenue uh, this month, uh, we are like 14% of where we were uh, pre-COVID 2019, January to, to August. Uh, last year, full uh, year uh, figures, 29% of uh, uh, 2019. Um, and the best post or the best month in terms of GGR um, since the pandemic hit was May uh, 2021, uh, with just uh, 10.4 billion patakas in, in, in gross gaming revenue. I can we kind of. Uh, make a sort of um, an educated guess as for what lies ahead uh, uh, in the in the new context. Yeah, look, it's a pointless exercise. I mean, we can talk about what yeah. the potential is. My view, very simplistically, is that the junket business in Macau is never going to come back. Okay, it's just never going to come back. I disagree with George completely. The junket business has been massively disrupted. It's not going to come back as long as China doesn't want it to come back. And I don't think China wants it to come back. And why it doesn't want it to come back is the following. The junkets made virtually no money in Macau. Okay, this has been a long-standing understanding in Macau that the junkets actually don't make money in Macau, and the operators don't make that much money from junkets. Right, the the, the EBITDA margin for junket business in Macau was around ten percent. Where the junkets made money was under the table betting, side betting. They made money overseas jurisdictions where the tax rates are either zero or approaching zero compared to a forty percent tax rate in Macau. And the casino operators in those jurisdictions are able to pay double or more the commission that they were being paid in Macau. So this concept that somehow the junkets are all going to rematerialize and come into Macau, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because I don't think China will allow it to happen. I don't think Macau will allow it to happen. And the operators don't want it to happen, right? If they need it, they'll take it, but they're not going to want it, right? So when we think about what does Macau look like in terms of revenue? That's not the important question. The important question is what does it look like in terms of profitability, right? That's where it's important because mass business, premium mass, base mass combined is a 30% plus margin business. For some operators, it's even better. Junket was 10%. For some operators, it was mid, mid to kind of high single digit percentage margins. So even though in 2019, 38% or so of GGR came from VIP and you know, a third of the GGR came from Junket, the profitability contribution to the bottom line was less than 15% from Junket, right? It's, it's, a, it's not a rounding error, but it's inconsequential. The real question is, can you replace that profit with mass and premium mass business? And over time, I believe you can, but you will also need to continue to expand the capacity in Macau and, and hotel room capacity, which is critically important. George is right with the notion that Thailand is going to potentially open up and it'll take some business. The reality is today in Macau, compared to Macau 20 years ago, the Asian landscape looks tremendously different on two landscapes. The first is on supply. There are many more casino operations across Asia than there were in, 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 in 2000. And in good locations. Right. Korea has expanded and will continue to expand. The Philippines is doing quite well. It's going to continue to expand. Singapore has been realistically a very phenomenal exercise, and that'll continue to grow. So, And then you look at all the Southeast Asian casinos that have popped up. Those aren't going anywhere. They're going to continue to grow. But also, the overall economies and the people's ability to spend money in many of these countries has also been increasing. So the potential demand has been increasing, not just in China, but across all of Asia. So there's a balance, right? And just because Thailand opens up six, six casinos doesn't mean that the entire business or half the business of Macau is gonna disappear. This was the same argument that was made in 2010 when Marina Bay Sands and Resorts World were gonna open up, all the business in Macau was gonna to go to Singapore. Well, no business from Macau went to Singapore. So I think what's important is to focus really on what matters, which is mass market, premium mass market, driving visitation back into Macau, and then thinking about how to utilize 38,000 hotel rooms to drive maximization of revenue for both the government and for the operators. And the reality is in order to have growth, in order to get GGR back to the numbers that we've seen before, just in terms of gross gaming revenues, which I don't think is gonna happen until 
after 2025, before we could even get to a GGR number anywhere near what we had in 2019, because that junket business is gone, you're going to need more hotel rooms. And we obviously have projects opening up. So, you know, we'll have more hotel rooms in four years time than we have than we had in 2019. That's a positive. We have hotel rooms that are no longer utilized by junkets that can be utilized for premium ass customers. That's a positive. So it, it's it's not a it's not a a simple look at what does the top line look like. Now, from the government's perspective, it's actually more difficult because the government gets 40% tax, whether it's mass, premium mass, VIP which is unique in Macau relative to other jurisdictions. Most other jurisdictions have a bifurcated tax structure. So I think what's really, really important is to focus on profitability. And that profitability is really driven by the mass market customer and potentially down the road, the integration of more high value and non-gaming amenities that customers would actually pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, Jose, Thank recall, you, please uh, join it. Yeah. I recall the day after Alvin Chao was arrested, um, I was going to ask you about that. Maybe, maybe yeah. I don't know if you allow me to jump in, uh, because because Vidali was talking about mass and premium mass, and I remember when we, I was preparing a follow up story on 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 that that you said that will be a spillover effect uh, from VIP to a premium mass, uh, and perhaps not many people were looking at that from that perspective. How do you regard that? Okay, I agree with most of what I mean, with every almost everything that Vitali said. I just want the one area that I have questions about. There's really three segments to Macau. There's junkets, which I agree were not worth much to the government. It was worth a lot. Thirty percent of their taxes came from it, but to the casinos, only fifteen percent of the EBITDA. That could be replaced with the additional three, four, five thousand hotel rooms coming in from Galaxy Space Two Four, Studio City, all the other properties could join in hotel rooms. That could be replaced by mass. Fantastic. It's the premium mass and the premium direct. The high rollers that are not directly affected by junkets, they are the biggest question mark because they're affected two ways. One, the junkets facilitated the flow of money into Macau because it's not reasonable for a guy to be betting two, three hundred thousand US per hand when we know that that is not the amount he's allowed to bring in. Who brought that over? Those bad, crazy, terrible criminal junkets, you know, the, the, the bad, bad guys who are gone. How are, the, how are the premium mass and premium direct patrons going to bring people? That's a big mystery. And number two, the visas for these group of people are being stopped. The same people that used to come two, three times a month, 20 to 30 times a year, that were premium mass and premium direct, they brought the money from junket, but they were able to go get their visas. Those people are being pulled aside and saying, why are you going to Macau? We were just there a couple months ago. And what's happening is they're, do they're slow walking those guys. So even if the guy manages to somehow bring the money over, which I doubt if he's going to, probably going to put maybe bring half or a third, the number of trips he used to make on a regular basis is going to go from 30 a year in those cases of the high end, uh, high uh, frequently people to maybe 12 a year. And that's going to have a dramatic effect, which is why I'm not as, as optimistic as Vitaly as to when the, the gaming revenue or the EBITDA is going to come back. Mass will come back. When COVID zero goes back, mass, which is base mass, brown, brine mass, me and you mass, they're going to come back. The mid group of people, I mean, the, the premium mass, premium direct, question mark, huge question mark. And the junket, goodbye. Not for the next 10, 15 years. I just don't so you have to come. If they come back in the name of junkets, they're really not junkets. A junket that has to report who this person is, the, the privacy is gone, where the money came from, that's not a junket. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. That uh, we have some uh, some of our participants joining the conversation, and we do encourage you all to uh, share with us uh, questions, uh, uh, remarks that they'd like to be addressed in in this webinar. Uh, Jill Reek um, says the Macau SAR should open the airport to international travel for mice and tourism. This means Macau Airport has to become an international destination and marketed as such. Um, it was going in that direction, but the concession held by Air Macau was renewed and the Macau SAR is keen to see an international business developing. Of course, this brings us to uh, the, the, you know, the bigger question of uh, luring uh, international visitation. Um, 
So we, we need uh, not only infrastructure, we need connectivity. Anyone wants to, to, to share uh, two cents on, on this matter? Look, I think this notion that somehow Macau can become a mice destination is, is ridiculous, okay? Just very simply, it's ridiculous. To run a destination center for mice, you're gonna need in Macau 100,000 hotel rooms to run a proper mice business, okay? Las Vegas has 150,000 hotel rooms. It runs at 90% occupancy. It has a world-class airport with connectivity to almost every city in the United States and many international cities. The airport sits 10 minutes from the Las Vegas Strip, right? And Vegas is relatively affordable. To try to replicate that in Macau is not gonna be feasible. You're just not gonna be able to have the connectivity and the hotel room availability in order to run a mice business that actually is impactful. Could you have mice? Absolutely. You've had mice in Macau before. Sands is able to fill some hotel rooms midweek, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. There's some smaller conventions, absolutely. But to have conventions of the scale that we're talking about in terms of being a top mice destination in Asia, it's impossible. The other problem on mice is that the greater Bay Area is oversaturated with mice capacity. Yeah, I was, I was going to yeah to, to to bring into the conversation the the future development hunching and you know how it, whether this could provide the space that uh, we would need for that. Well, it could or it couldn't. It depends what's built there and how easy then it is to come come into Macau or is the concept to just have mice in Henshin, right, geared towards mainland Chinese customers. I don't know why you'd want to do that because Zhuhai has an enormous capacity of mice already. And that's just Zhuhai. That's just right there. You've got Hong Kong, you've got Guangdong, right? You've got other cities across Guangdong that have mice capacity of scale, right? It's not just mice. It's not just having an airport that allows a flight to come in from Manila and a flight to come in from Bangkok that's going to give you mice. You need a whole host of other amenities and you need hotel rooms. None of that exists in Macau. It just doesn't. So the other question on mice, if we're talking about general mice, is are you going to be able to have mice business from mainland China of any scale in Macau? And I think the answer is no, because most companies in Macau are not going to want to send people to Macau for conventions. It's still a little bit of a taboo when it comes to this type of travel. So if you're an international business in Asia and you want to hold a convention and your choices are Hong Kong, or Singapore, or Macau, where do you think most companies are going to go? They're not going to go to Macau. That's the reality of the situation, right? Could it be a small amenity? Sure. Could it drive some incremental visitation midweek? Sure. But it's never going to be of large scale. What, what you just said, Vitaly, is what was the predominant thinking in the US. And Sheldon Ellison proved that wrong. Okay? That's wrong. There is George, that's wrong. No, no, that's George, that's wrong. No, no. That's absolutely right. In the set, for that, for his business, I know that his 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 LVS convention center is not the largest one in Las Vegas, but it is possible to grow. Now, is there competition? Yes. With what we're talking about is the model of Las Vegas, which you keep insisting is wrong, and I think you know it's wrong because we're never going to have in account the possibility of having the majority of the revenue generated from non game I think we can agree on that, obviously. But should we try to have other areas of entertainment, especially in mice, growing? Yes. How to do it? Well, clearly, nobody put a pistol on, on, on the head of Venetian or LIVS to create that, that, that the, the, the huge investment they made on the convention center and to create the model of operation based on that. Clearly, there are operators that think that it is possible to grow. Now, there should be incentives for that to go, to go on. And that is where the Macau governments, one after the other, failed. If you don't create incentives, everybody's going to, all the managers of any, of any casino gaming group are going to wish to have to maximize the gaming, the gaming revenue. And one square foot of gaming is far more profitable than one square foot of any other activity, let alone the mice activity. But this is why the modeling of, of a strategy defined is difficult to make, but it should go in that direction. Now, should we expect that the percentage of the mice activity should, is going to grow significantly? No, it's not. Should we want to compete with Guangzhou and with Hong Kong and with Singapore? Yes. And mind you, it is true, absolutely true, that many conventions moved from other places to Las Vegas because people wanted to have a good time at the same time that they were doing that. This is not wrong. 
And now, what we can disagree is that probably it was not Sheldon that invented it because the large, because in the large uh, convention center is public, is is owned by the by, by the by the municipality, and it worked. But is it possible to increase the level of of of, of visitation and to change significantly to change a bit at least the kind of business that is being generated there? Yes, it is. Yes, it is possible. Now, casino operators don't like that. They don't like that. The casino operators, all of them, they want to maximize profits. And maximize profits is to have the amount of, to have an integrated resort that is balanced enough to bring in customers so that they, they, they can gain, they, they go to gaming. That's it. Should the public policy be defined in, in, in wishing to grow in, in two or three other areas? Yes. Not 11, not everything. And Macau does not have critical mass, does not have rooms, does not have the capacity the, 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 to, 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 to manage all these new areas. Sorry. So it's okay, it's okay. Uh, and actually, I'd like to bring one, one question from Anthony Lamb into the conversation, which regards uh, entertainment. Um, you know, like entertainment as a drive for diversification, uh, the introduction of stage entertainment uh, has also nurtured many field workers in the industry. Uh, what are your expectations in this respect? That's what Anthony Lamb asks. Anyone wants to jump in on the entertainment There's been two side of the equation, right? There's been a two entertainment attempts. One was Zaya at Venetia. Yeah. And it's a swing and a miss. One was House of Dancing Water, which was a great hit. That's it. I mean, I don't think entertainment is the reason people are going to come go through the hassle of paying more for a flight than to go internally, getting a visa and getting a flight to come in here to see entertainment. There's plenty of these entertainment that could happen in China. So I, don't, I, I, think, I think the government Comparison to Las Vegas is very difficult. The American mindset, gambling is entertainment. I will go gamble for an hour and a half. I'll go have dinner. I'll go watch a show. Maybe I'll gamble another 30 minutes. If I lose, that's it. That is not the typical Chinese mindset when it comes to gambling. They gamble here because that's the only reason they come to Macau. They don't come to Macau because of the restaurants. They don't come to Macau because of the entertainment. And it's very difficult to get these people who are serious gamers to go and do the Michelin and mice and all these other exhibitions. It's very difficult. And one more thing. I work for the, the gaming company the, the, for Venetian in Las Vegas and Venetian in Macau. Every one of these operators would love to have mice midweek. From Sunday through Thursday night, there's plenty of hotel rooms that they can actually go to do that. The problem is the government did not give them enough new cards to hire the right staff, the airport, in Macau is small, you can only have short haul, medium haul, you cannot have long haul. So it's really difficult to get people to come in from the airport when you're five minutes away to the Hong, from Hong Kong airport, five minutes away from Hong Kong Convention Center versus 45 minutes to come to Macau. Macau is at a major disadvantage. It's very difficult to get mice up and running in Macau. Uh, thank you, Ali Dad. Uh, I would also, maybe you can also join the conversation on, on, on entertainment, Vitaly, but meanwhile, we have another question from Rebecca Choi. Uh, what about the let me just yeah, go ahead, ahead. Let me just let me just uh, go ahead, please. On entertainment, I think you know the problem in Macau that you have is that the, the length of visitation, the length of stay in Macau is very short. Yeah. First off, half the visitors coming in are day trippers, right? They're they're in Macau for less than 12 hours. No one coming into Macau for, for, for less than 12 hours is gonna go spend two hours or two and a half hours watching a show. Right. When you have large scale concerts at the Venetian, for example, when we used to have those, you would have hordes of people coming in from from Hong Kong to go to these concerts. That works. That model works. One off concerts. Those work. But to have a standing show that costs one hundred million dollars to produce and then have a customer come in and sit there for two and a half hours when the average length of stay for even an overnight visitor is one night, you're just not going to get people to do it because they don't have enough time. That's, that's actually one of the problems. The, the, Vegas is such a different animal where people are coming and staying in Vegas for four nights, right? The average length of stay in Vegas is over four days. You come in for a convention, a lot of people stay for the weekend, right? You have plenty of time to go to a show. You have plenty of time to go to a multitude of restaurants. You have plenty of time to do a whole host of other activities. 
and many of the people gamble, but you have a whole host of time to do everything else. When your length of stay in Macau is one or two days, it's just not going to happen. Mm. So the question around entertainment is, first off, you have to put on entertainment that people want to see, number one. If you're doing acrobatics, like Sands tried to do back in the early days at Venetian, there's better acrobatic shows in China. People weren't going to go see that. The water show at City of Dreams was short, right? It funneled people in and out, um, geared around the casino. People would come in and they would see something they really couldn't see in China. That show worked, right? So it's, it's a question of putting on things that actually work for the market. The concept of putting on, you know, the Michael Jackson show that you have a Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, which lasts two and a half hours, that's not going to work in a market where people come in for one day, which is not going to work. How about any prospect of extending the length of stay? It, it's not easy, right? It's been consistently like that, right? Well, the hotel rooms, hotel rooms. The hotel rooms are the problem. Yeah. You know, even when Ali Dad was talking about mice, absolutely. You'd love to have group visitors come in, group guarantee locked in rooms on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, on a Thursday. But without all that mice business that doesn't really exist in Macau, it's relatively small, you're still at 90% occupancy. Sure, the week the weekday, it's lower, it's 80, 82%, that's fine. Okay, you can do a little bit of mice, but incrementally, you're not gonna be able to do that much until you have a lot more hotel rooms. One of the questions when it comes to all these uh, uh, non-gaming requirements and the, the 11 points got to do with what if, you know, but, you know, like we will have the uh, bidders uh, uh, putting forth a lot of ideas and projects for marine development, tourism, sports, wellness, et cetera, uh, that they may surely potentially have to um, fulfill as part of commitments. Let's just presume that. Uh, but how about, you know, we don't really know from each other. And at the end of the day, we'll have a pretty messy situation. Isn't, isn't that a risk? Like if you have to commit to certain projects and then you don't really know where is your uh, competitive advantage and you know your business development because the, the, those who are bidding for the concession they need to put forth all these I mean at least it should be uh, to fulfill the points and to to come up with uh, all of these ideas or we shouldn't take it at face value. I know, Vital, you wanna. Join here or, or Arida. Um, I, my, my pessimism is that, according to George, we are in a ditch, right? We were doing great and now we're in a big hole. Mm -hmm. And we need to get out of the, the ditch. Unfortunately, the same people who got us into the ditch are the ones responsible for getting us out of the ditch. I think we're, I'm very pessimistic about how this government is going to be pro IR. They not they may not be pro gaming, but there are six integrated resort companies in Macau. They're not six non gaming companies in Macau. There are six. They're not six gaming companies. There are six integrated resort companies. You need the government to partner up with the the non gaming with the gaming and non gaming IR operators collectively. You need to give them the lands to build hotels. You need to give them the visas. You need to get them the proof cards. You need to get them the, the, the ability for people to come in. And I just don't have enough faith for this government, which keeps saying, gimme, 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 which, without giving anything back on its own responsibility to do anything. I, this is where my- you, You're absolutely right. Let me say this. You're absolutely right in the sense that um, it is necessary that, um, I don't like the idea that casino operators usually reiterate that uh, they are partners with the government because of the high level of taxation. But what we need, it should speak plainly, is we need a government that understands that whether integrated resorts or concessionaires of, of gaming, it's a business. A business needs to make money, needs to be profitable. Now, if you allow them to operate with good margins, then you can negotiate and you have well, the, the power to impose some things that part of the profits or part of the revenue is then allocated for other purposes. And this should be integrated with the planning decided by the government. Now, when you have, but the key issue, I agree, is that the government must be sensitive to the business scope of things, must have entrepreneurial sensitivity. Now, if you have a government of offensive, 
civil servants that are scared as hell because the political situation is very difficult and conditioned by variables that are exogenous and that they cannot control. And they are the government of a small city in, in, in China that does not have, never has had a lot of leeway. I understand the difficulty, but if you don't have that entrepreneurial sensitivity, it's going to be very difficult. I fully agree with that. And this is something that has nothing to do with this tender. This is something that is inherent to the way in which the government was chosen, because probably arising from the fears that Beijing had of the incidents that took place in Hong Kong. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that, yes, the government is going to be, it's probably not going to be very sensitive to things. Perhaps it is wise in this situation to get, to let the, 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 the managers of the resorts and the groups that, that have came in to, to do some of the things that the government cannot plan nor, nor, feels, that, nor feels comfortable to, to, to undertake the responsibility to do and probably should, but at the same time, it creates the responsibility for, for uh, creates a responsibility for casino gaming that is not wise in an environment where the government is not sensitive to the business side of this, uh, uh, of the venture. So this, in my opinion, this is very, very complicated and the tender should have never been open at this stage. Now, I know it's too late, but it's with this level of uncertainty, you're never going to have very great commitments. I think that's what we're going to find out. We are going to see, I speak regularly with several people inside several of the groups. I think we're going to have to see a split of all the activities, a legal engineering taking place to split everything in order to safeguard assets. But this is not the way that things should have been done. If you want to diversify, if you want to count on them to diversify, you need to allow them to operate with good margins and you need them to speak with them about how to define a policy and, uh, and on which directions you go. Even if it's wrong, even if, 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 if investment analysts think that too much money should not go into mice or into museums or entertainment or other things, but if the policy is that, negotiate that. You try to impose something that is against the business nature of the groups, which the financing entities are not going to like, and therefore this is not going to end up well. Yes. This said, this said, the most key factor, because people like to speak about entertainment and Macau as a civil aviation hub and all that, all that is secondary, I agree. But the key issue is something that none of us can guarantee, but where clearly we, we don't have an agreement, is that I don't think that the junket business, which represented in 2019 probably an overall of 12 billion US, nobody is going to wipe that out and discount that. Nobody. Nobody politically can do it, nor should do it. And that reality will have, it, it will be necessary to do some kind of accommodation and to find out how that can work. If, and remember, if China wanted to give instructions for that to end, it would have given, and that piece of legislation would have been revoked. That was not the case. So we are going to have gaming promotion and gaming promoters operating. They're not going to rebrand themselves and go to operate now in Southeast Asia and Japan and India. So obviously they will continue to operate in China. How that is going to happen, none of us knows. I don't think anyone knows, but this is the key factor that is going to make a significant part of the of the gaming business of Macau, and the gaming business of Macau is not only the concessionaires and the level of jobs and the level of and the number of hotels depend on how this policy, how this part of the policy is accommodated. And regrettably, I don't think many I don't see many people putting on the table possibilities or options. And this this needs to be addressed. This is going to be what is going to to, to determine what is the size of Macau in the coming five to 10 years. But nobody, nobody wipes out 12 billion US. Well, uh, uh, oh, George, of course they do. Look at what happened between 2012 and two, or 2013 and 2016, right? They wiped out $20 billion of GGR and only a small fraction of that came back. So to sit here and say that we're not gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to look at the junkets and bring them back. I don't think that's gonna happen. The government has been very, very clear in China about what the junkets have done that was bad. 
right? And it wasn't just about online gaming. That was a big part of it. It wasn't just about taking players overseas. That was a large part of it. It's also anti-money laundering. It's also the illicit movement of capital, right? It's also the bad things that come with overextension of debt in a market, in an environment, and in a jurisdiction where giving out gambling debts is illegal. This is the problem with the junket industry. It's not a guy finding a rich guy and bringing him over. That's not a junket. You don't need to do that. A, a gaming operator can do that. It's moving the money. It's providing credit. It's taking collateral in China. It's forcing the guy to pay you. That's what the junket oh, business does. Oh, oh. Vitaly, I, I heard almost all the American groups saying we want to be able to grant credit. We are going to do that and we're not going to work with junkets. In the end, they all work with junkets. Well, because the, know, the system existed. The system existed, existed no, 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 no. They, they were with the junkets. Listen, listen, no one is going to take the risk of going to an activity that can create legal issues inside mainland China, to put it mildly. And, and, and neither is the government I'm kind of interested in that, any of it. So that's why there, there are middle entities that to do that. First. Secondly, not, yes. not with the existing government in China. If you're telling me the existing no, no, no. government of China changes no. and they allow no, no. it to happen again, then it will. Look, I, I, I'm a great upholder of analyzing reality, departing from the facts. And what the, the facts we are have been mentioned here restrictions on visas, questioning people, increasing the control. But the, the reality is that the network that exists for the gaming operators, which I'm not saying it's ideal, okay, but the network that exists and which is a count, which, 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 which moves a GGR of 12 billion. So this, if, if you make a, 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 a simple reasoning, assume that almost all of this is based on Baccarat where the win is 3%, this gives you a huge amount of revenue that is being involved in, in, in the betting. Uh, I'm not going to get into the side betting, but then it would be even, even, even bigger. So these, the, nobody wipes an economic reality of that kind. That's my point. Okay. Now, the way to accommodate and the number of entities that are linked inside China is probably one of the reasons why the, the repression took place. Okay. This is not, again, I mean, you say the right things. Macau is not. The operation in Macau is not like in, in the US, and here gamblers do not come to, 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 to get entertained, they come to gamble. It's true. But then you don't do the same semantic reasoning. The way the junk operate in China has nothing to do with any other market. Nothing. Okay? And even, even in Singapore, it's difficult to, because they, 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 they apparently have the, the, the junk as they are angels, because we don't know anything about the operation. But in, in the connections that you need to have, not that much in terms of marketing and promotion, but at the level of collecting the credit, are connections that do not only involve guys with a dragon tattoo here. They involve people with sticks and guns, okay? They involve chiefs of police, they involve military chiefs and so on. This is a huge network. Is it desirable? No. Is it how it works? Yes, this is how it works. Is this going to disappear? No. It's possible that some of the repression was done because some of those uh, generals that were semi-gods in, in military compounds had to be repressed to, to strengthen the leadership? Probably. That, that was used also to curtail the fight on corruption? Yes, but the reality, the economic reality that is underneath all the, this business is not going to disappear. And it is necessary to think how it's going to evolve and to see if there's anything that can be done in terms of public policy and accommodating that. And Vitaly, Look, I spoke with all, I met regularly with all the, the foreign operators, all the non-Chinese casino operators in Macau. They were all too happy not to know what was going on in the VIP areas. They even said this to the anti-money laundering uh, body of, for, for Asia Pacific. So that kind of posture is not going to change. Money talks and everything else works. So if the junket business George, that away. posture has changed already. No, With everything that's no. happened, it's changed already. And the junkets and the junkets have been migrating their business overseas because the economic reality of doing business in Macau with the Macau tax structure and the AML restrictions that are in Macau relative to places like the Philippines and Laos and Cambodia and other parts of Asia, no one is going to do business in Macau under those terms. That's even assuming that China allows any of this to happen in mainland China. Vitaly, that business I'll, is I'll dead and it's not coming back. One more thing. Digital renminbi is coming. Yes. It's five years away. 
with digital RMB, you every piece of money that comes into Macau has to be accounted. Where did this come from? Where is your income coming in here? That is going to devastate premium mass, premium direct, and junkets. Now, we don't know whether it's going to be in the five year window or the next 10 year window, but I'm telling you, it is going to be very difficult. Junk kits are gone from Macau. No, they are not. We will see. We will see. But let, let me tell you one thing. When you say that uh, the Chinese authorities do not want it, or when Vitaly says, well, they are migrating to other jurisdictions. These, I have been hearing this for 15 years regarding Korea or the Philippines. The level of migration is small. That's not the true. That's not true, George. The level of migration is not small. Look at the VIP revenue being generated in the Philippines. Look at it at Naga in other parts of Cambodia. Look at Korea and add it all up. And look how I'm much business has left. I'm talking about 2019. It is small. Up to 2019, it is small in overall. The, it, you need to have uh, a, a destination that really has the potential to to, to be appealing for, for the junkets, to ta for, for the customers of the junkets. The zero percent tax rate is very appealing for any junket and any VIP player that plays on commission. And and why do you think we're going to go back to 2019? Alton Shah was arrested in 2021. Libo was arrested in February 2022. We are not going to go and put the genie back in the bottle, right? That, that is just not going to happen. The I agree. I repeat, the accusations are not based on Macau gaming. The, the, the only accusations that were done was in Macau because the Macau government felt so uneasy that the public prosecutor's office had to come with those dozens of accusations uh, from, from in 48 hours. But the point is, in the main in mainland China, if there was a willingness to curtail the activity, that would have been done, and the Macau government would have received instructions, and the legislation would have changed. Period. That's my point. Okay, they did not receive some instructions. The legislation on junkets was almost no cha not changed. Every everybody wants to assess the situation. Is it is, is Alvin going Shao is still in prison? Is Alvin Chow still in prison? Please let me know. It looks as though he must have been released the way you're talking about it. So everything's back to normal. No, no. Look, the good thing about the junkets is if you have if you if, if two or three or five or ten of them have a problem, the, the, the position in the market will be will, will be occupied by others. I don't think that is not a problem for Macau. The problem of Macau is to understand if the central government has a problem with the existence of Macau junkets or not. Okay, and up to now, in my opinion, there is not a clear cut decision. Is are there restrictions to avoid to, so that to limit the number of visitors and the frequency? Absolutely, I agree that is a fact. Okay, the rest, if there were instructions, you would have seen that in the amendment of legislation, and that is not has not taken place. Okay, it's just my point. So everybody's thinking about how to not how not to lose those twelve billion of of, of 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 gaming revenue and how to do things in a way that can accommodate everybody. Just think about uh, at this stage, nobody's Sorry, looking, no. nobody's worried about the twelve billion of VIP. They're worried about the twenty-four billion of mass. That's all they care about. Every single operator in Macau. That's all they care about. This overemphasis on twelve billion dollars of junket business. Is actually a rounding error to the profit to the profitability of the industry. Talking about the operators, and actually this is a burning question, as a, perhaps a sort of uh, I wouldn't say an elephant in the room, but uh, the point has got to do with the fact we're six days away from uh, the 14th of uh, September, the deadline for submitting the uh, um, bids for the gaming concessions. And of course, and here we have a, a question by uh, Macau Business Senior Gaming Analyst Antonio Lobo Villela. Will we see any player aside from the current big six uh, bidding for a concession? We want, who wants to make a guess? Will there be a dark horse? I already answered that in the Q and A. Yeah. I'm not sure if everybody saw it, but there's just quick answer. Two reasons: No, there will not be a new operator. A, where are they going to build? I don't think Parcel Seven and Eight across the street from Studio City is going to be given to anybody. And two, we have a 10-year concession. It's going to cost you three or four years just to build, and perhaps four, five, six billion dollars to build one. Who's going to go ahead and spend five, six billion dollars? And only get six, seven years of guaranteed continued life because, as far as we know, 10 years from now, it may not it may be taken away. So I just don't see anybody in post the seven and eight, company, any, any seventh or eighth concession coming from there. Vitaly, your take on this? 
Well, we know there's going to be six concessions and we know that there are six operators and I find it very implausible that one of the six is not going to get a concession. So will you get other bidders? I don't know. Yeah. It's possible. You can always have other, like, you know, Ali, Dad and I could put a bid in. I mean, and now it's a little bit too late, it's but like you can put a bid in. The question is like, is anyone going to win? And I think the answer is no, no one else is going to win. George, uh, uh, and, a, and a linked question here, connected question is put forth by Wendy Tong. Uh, will we see any chance of uh, uh, somehow, well, uh, you know, a bidder linked with a with a with a state-owned company uh, to try uh, and you know join join the tender? No, neither neither, neither a state-owned enterprise nor a, a large. Uh, I mean, I think maybe group. maybe it could be sort of even a private even a private group from China. No, no, no Chinese mainland group can come to the tender. Period. Okay. Um, the, no, but, but especially SOE is completely yeah, impossible. I tend to agree with my colleagues in terms of uh, in terms of the, the number of, of tenders. I wouldn't exclude, however, the possibility that an already existing group, large one, that may that always has had an interest on in having a footprint in Macau, may want to come to the tender. Now, uh, if the um, I didn't feel the I didn't follow it completely, but the, if the, the scoring weight has been defined, which I didn't see, if it is similar to the one that on the last tender, uh, and if it gives 50% or something similar to the, to, to the ability to raise gaming revenue, because that's the, what is inherent to the legal nature of the casino gaming concession, then the Macau government will never risk a new operator vis-a-vis -vis one that already exists. Um, so I tend to think that even if anyone comes, it will be one or two. I'm thinking about entities like Harris or like Genting, things, entities that have the, the capacity to, uh, and the interest on, on be, having a foot in Macau, but, and they always wanted to, but I don't think that at the end of the day, that will be the case. But again, it is important to see the scoring weight. I didn't see that anywhere, but it's probably my fault. Um, uh, a question while well, we have uh, some 10 minutes left before we wrap up our session. Uh, we have a question here from lawyer, uh, Macau-based lawyer, Pedro Cortes. The conversation is based upon the fact that gaming will continue to be legal in Macau. What if with a black crystal ball, the policy changes and gaming is no longer legal beyond 2035 when the 10 plus three years of the new concessions end? First of all, a black crystal ball, you can't see through the crystal ball. So that's one of the challenges. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of that. But uh, that is the doomsday scenario that my dear pessimistic friend Pedro Cortez always says, the, the anti-George, we got the George who's very, very optimistic today, and we got Pedro who's very pessimistic. I seriously doubt that's going to happen. I think there is a possible, there's a very, very small possibility Macau will eventually become mass. Um, that's the extent by which they're going to go through with it. I think Macau will just become mass, maybe base mass. China will exert more and more pressure on the premium and the high limit areas. And uh, that's the worst case scenario, which I just don't see happening. Yeah. Vitaly, I mean, will you have something to share with regards to this? Yeah, I think there's a scenario where that could happen. That scenario was China becoming isolationist, getting rid of capitalism, closing the border, and basically saying, Macau, go back to what you were before, um, either a black, kind of black hole operation, or just completely become a, a subsumed part of Zhuhai, right? That's a possibility. I think it's low probability that that happens, but I think that's, that's where that type of scenario with no gaming in Macau comes into being. Thank you, George. George, you're on Sorry, I'm, um, I mean, I, ahead, I like also the, I like the alternative scenarios that Pedro Cortez sometimes puts, but this, this one seems to me like those, those, those risk factors that sometimes appear on the perspectives like possibility of invasion by the PLA. I, mean, <laughs> I don't see gaming becoming unlawful in Macau, but more important than that, why, why, why is that the case? Because although today we are all, in, I mean, we have zillions of news about the possibility 
war because of Taiwan and the militarization of the, of the South China Sea and all that. At the end of the day, Macau, after the mess that existed in Hong Kong, Macau needs to be a successful case for China. It is important that it is a successful case. Politically, it is important. Sometimes we forget that uh, the, the way in which the government became more tough and, be, and because of the decoupling with the West and all that, we, we, we believe that things have changed. But the reality is no leader of China will want to stay in history for being responsible for bloodshed in the civil war. So the SARs are the best model they have to show that it is possible to accommodate some kind of success and autonomy and preservation of the way of life. Today, I, I know that it, it seems a far-fetched thing and the people readjust uh, their, their expectations, but I don't think that Macau can have any possibility of becoming an autonomous region uh, with a good level of, with a good quality of life for the people that live there if gaming disappeared before 2049. I don't think that is, I, I, would, I would say that most likely things are going to continue. And I'm not, mind you, I'm not over optimistic. I am optimistic in the sense that I learned is one of the advantages of being old, that in time, that things, that change comes at a lower pace, the, the lower pace than we think. And I really think that things are going to change slowly after the pandemic, after the, 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 the lockdowns created by, by, by zero COVID policy. I am a great believer that things will be, and everybody will be interested in keeping them as close to the prior operation um, as possible. Thank, thank you, Josh. As for uh, anyone who wants to join here? Oh, so yeah, I mean, let's go for a final take. <laughs> um, your concluding remarks. Uh, I don't know, Josh. You 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 would like to add something? Uh, you were kind of uh, kind of uh, pointing in the direction of uh, what lies ahead. Uh, is there silver lining, and uh, how do you anticipate the uh, coming uh, decade for Macau? Uh, the, the the bigger risks have been pointed out since the beginning. It's it's the uncertainty arising from the situation in China. Macau is completely dependent on the visitation from China. Um, and um, unlike Hong Kong, but uh, it, Macau is completely dependent and therefore it has really, the criticism in the dynamic zero COVID policy is, is really not very fair in the sense that Macau doesn't have any leverage there. Uh, if, if it, when it has 30 cases, they block the border, you know, nothing works. So Macau will have to follow closely the evolution of, of, China, of China's mainland. Um, we don't, on the other hand, Chinese economy is slowing down. The second quarter was stagnated. The fact that they decided to put the real estate sector in order obviously uh, is not helping in terms of timing. Uh, nobody really knows what is going to happen from here until the end of the year. The party decided that stability is the priority, but um, uh, we don't really know if the economy is going to grow. Foreign trade data recently is, I think gives, gives some hope, but it is possible that in terms of disposable income, this will have an impact even when, when the borders open and visitation comes back. Um, I think that we should make scenarios on, on, on the future based on the entrepreneurial and business reality of, of this, this sector, but we should not let that, we should not forget that the wishful thinking that suddenly VIP gaming is going to win because it has very low margins for casino operators is going to be like that. No, this is wishful thinking. It's not going to happen like that. And we are going to have VIP happening in Macau. How is that going to happen? It is still uncertain. It is unclear. But again, nobody, nobody wipes out 12 billion uh, US uh, of revenue. And, and there are many, many people with vested interest in, 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 in that regard, starting with the Macau government. This said, the way to do it, unfortunately, should be with a government more sensitive to the business realities and to the, with, with a, with a sent, entrepreneurial sensitivity. We don't have that. So we are not, I, I, it's very difficult to, 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 to see how the scenarios will evolve. And uh, I think it's going to be, and, and I think, I'm very curious to see, to be honest, what kind of um, proposals are going to be submitted, especially for those non-gaming uh, areas. 
We're all I very hope, curious about that. Very looking, looking forward to. I hope all the, all the, I hope all the groups are, are prudent. I hope all the groups are prudent because they face uh, civil servants that uh, will not have uh, any leniency on the commitments that they that they make. And uh, and uh, even if it destroys the the goods of the goods of the golden eggs, and this is the biggest risk from a company. Thank you uh, for now, Vitali. Your your final take: uh, the goose that lays the golden eggs um, may not be alive and kicking, but uh, will it uh, uh, weather the storm? Uh, what's your what's your concluding remark? Look, Macau Macau should be able to come back once China moves forward on reopening its economy and reopening its borders, you know, what level of, of revenue do we get there to and how long does it take and what winds up happening with respect to new developments, I think is all an open question. Um, the one thing to remember is that the operators are not in the same financial position that they were five years ago. Um, they're more levered. They've basically been the social welfare program of Macau for the past two and a half years. And by the time this is all said and done, three and a half years, maybe longer. And the reality is to expect any of the operators to come in and start spending billions and billions of dollars on new development in untested waters with respect to new projects is completely unrealistic. I think all the operators are going to be very prudent with respect to what they're proposing. Um, I think it is beyond the realm of reality to expect anyone to come in and start building multi-billion dollar non-gaming properties in Macau for one major reason, aside from the fact that nobody has the money. Macau hasn't even allocated any land for development. Nobody even knows where things are gonna be allowed, right? This is all hypothetical. And this is what goes back to our original, I think George was saying the same thing. The government needs to act as a partner to the industry in order to drive Macau forward in terms of its economic growth, led by gaming and diversifying to other ancillary areas. It cannot be done in a vacuum. It just can't. So until the government actually comes to this realization, we're gonna be stuck in the situation where the operators are gonna play games with the government, the government is gonna play games with the operators. And I don't think a whole lot's gonna get done anytime in the near future as a result. Thank you, Vitali. Uh, uh... Ali Dad, uh, a year ago in another panel I, I hosted, you predicted giving taxes to be raised. Um, well, uh, and that did happen. Uh, uh, well, slightly, but it did happen. It turned out that you're correct. What else do you see in your crystal ball and what's your final take on, on, on the whole conversation? Um, I actually see a positive Macau. I'm, I'm not being a pessimist. I just want to clarify. Let me give you some numbers. I think the, Macau, the various six gaming companies have spent something like 35 to 40 billion US dollars in building the properties in Kotai in the, since the 20 years ago, something between 35 and 40 billion. The good news is going forward the next 10 years, the amount of capital expenditure to build these new properties is going to be minimal. There's going to be a couple of phases here, a couple, maybe three or four billion. So they're going to basically live on these existing beautiful integrated resorts, which are well-maintained. In 2019, the collective six gaming companies made 9 billion US in EBITDA, that's earning before interest. Mm -hmm. Think about it as net profit. Forget GGR, I'm not gonna get into that conversation. So $9 billion was made in profit from the gaming operators, of which about one, maybe one and a half billion was coming from junkets, given their very low margin. So. I think that 9 billion can be achieved. It's a, there's a distinct possibility that five, six, 10 years from now, the numbers will go back up to the 9 billion. I'm not as optimistic as Vitaly about how soon that happens. And that could be compensated by the additional room capacity, by the additional uh, the hotel rooms, and by the new dictate of the mainland China government, the Cal government to go ahead and spend more money on non-gaming. <clears throat> so that junket hole, which is considered unhealthy will be filled by the, uh, the non-gaming and the more healthier mass. The uncertainty lies whether or not it's premium mass and mass. So I think there's a 50-50 chance that 10 years from now we'll be back at the current 9 billion EBITDA numbers as we see. I think there's a 30-40% chance that because of the, the premium mass and premium direct going down, um, 
we're going to have maybe six billion dollars, which is still significant given the fact that they're not going to spend that much more money on additional money. So I see the future of Macau not as rosy as uh, as Vitali uh, sees, but I just I see a bright future. Will Macau be as dominant as it used to be? No, Philippines going to go bigger. Korea is going to get bigger. Japan's eventually going to come into the picture. Singapore, Thailand, there's going to be a lot more competition. So I don't see Macau changing colors in terms of who it caters to. It will continue to be catering mostly for the mainland Chinese. So, you, so you're long on Macau? I'm long on Macau, but I'm not super long on Macau. I just think there's a big possibility that they're going to go make two thirds, maybe half, two thirds of what they made, which is still astronomical. Nine billion dollars profit per year is amazing. So even half of that tree, one tree is going to have half the yield. It's still a lot of apples that are going to come out of that tree. It's still enviable compared to any other property, any other jurisdiction, including the Las Vegas. Thank you very much for your final take and thanks a lot. Uh, it's time for us to wrap up this uh, exciting webinar. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you three guest speakers, uh, experts who joined us uh, uh, kindly, George Costa Oliveira, Vitaly Monsky, Alida Tash. Thank you very much for this free flow um, and uh, exciting uh, talk uh, on such a pivotal matter for all of us uh, and for the city and the region. I uh, thank you very much, uh, France Macau Chamber of Commerce for this cooperation. Uh, thank you, uh, Rutger and the whole team of FMCC, Stephanie and all of you. Uh, you may uh, stay tuned to Macau News Agency, Macau Business and Business Intelligence. We will obviously be um, uh, reporting about this talk and also about what is going to happen uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, these are um, critical and also exciting times for uh, for Macau. Thank you, uh, and thank you all, you all, all those of you who joined us via Zoom and uh, shared your views, uh, comments, and questions. Thanks a lot, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Thank you very much.